heard, uh, and kind of the theme that we're going to be uh, talking about, or we have been talking about. Does anybody know who D.L. Moody is? Dwight L. Mo- Dwight L. Moody. Um, if you don't, there's a uh, even I think a college after him, named after him, where people go to school to learn uh, theology, and so he was a famous preacher, teacher, and uh, he had. Uh, some grammatical errors or uh, when he would speak at times. And so one of his very educated uh, followers or parishioners came up to him and said, my dear, um, uh, so um, he goes up to him and basically reprimanded him for his grammar. Uh, And Dwight L. Moody, D.L. Moody states, uh, tells the guy this, he says, my dear fellow, I wish my grammar were better. I wish I had better education, but I am using all the grammar I have for the glory of God. Are you doing as much with yours? And when I heard that, I was like, I was reminded of times at Building on the Rock where we had a pastor. I did not say things properly at times, and I don't either. Um, Not the greatest reader, uh, but... Uh, But mainly I was reminded of Pastor Bob in the past. He was just always still in the battle and in the game, whereas some of those other people were just not. And they were not using their gifts the way that God called them to use them. Now, at today's message, a lot of times, you know, we're looking at a few different people, usually when we hear a message on Sunday. We're always looking at ourselves. Uh, but uh, we might be looking at lost people. It might be focused on reaching them. It might be about building community and focusing here on us. But to be honest, today's message is really solely 100% focused on you. And I'm hoping that you would walk out of here feeling challenged in some way uh, by this message or by this conversation. We've been talking about stewardship and what is proper biblical stewardship that we should have uh, what, what is a mindset that you and I should be taking on? And we've talked about uh, these resources that we've been given, these things like time, talent, treasure, and temple, and that we need to look at these things in our life and constantly be putting them before God and saying, God, am I using this? Is this being used to glorify you? Am I doing with what God has given me? Am I using what God has given me for his purposes and for his glory? Or I would have no problem critiquing others. And, and so I'm really hoping this is more of an introspective message where you are reflecting upon your own attitude, but mainly your own faithfulness to God. And we're going to use something that I've been told not to use, okay, um, in, a, in a message as my main text, a parable. So that's been told to me before. Don't use a parable as your main preaching test. We're going to do that today, okay? Uh, But I'm going to help us set the table a little bit to help us understand what um, Matthew 25 uh, tells us in the parable of the talents. Now, that might be read in a few different ways in your Bibles, or it might be named certain certain things or differently in your Bible, maybe a bag of gold or... um, other things. It's also very familiar to the text that we read in Luke 19. And so, um, but when we look at this, if you have a Bible like mine, um, and there's a lot of red letters, many of us know this, these are all words that are specifically spoken by Jesus. So when you look at it and we get to this passage in Matthew 25, 14, I see red letters, but I also see before it red letters And so it's like Jesus, and then I see in 24, I see red letters, red letters. There's a lot of red letters. I want to find out what the black letters say. It seems like Jesus is just going on this really long preaching, and they just transcribed it in here for him. I want to know what kind of set up this preaching, this teaching that Jesus kind of started talking about. Because when when I read the parable, and we'll we'll see, see in a moment, but it's, it's really not talking about what we think it's talking about. Let, let, me, uh, let me read the first three verses of 25 uh, when we see the black letters. Okay, it says, or 24, I'm sorry. It says, Jesus left the temple 
and was walking away when his disciples came to him to call his attention to its buildings. Do you see all these things? He asked. So Jesus is drawing his disciples' attention to the buildings. Truly, I tell you, not one, one stone here will be left on one another. Everyone will be thrown down. Now, that's pretty extreme because the disciples and the Jewish people loved their temple and they loved their buildings and they loved and they worshiped. When people would come from afar, they would have to climb up a hill and they would see this temple laid with gold and they would be shining in the sky and people would go, wow, there is nothing that will ever take that down. Now, Jesus is saying, I tell you, not one stone will be left on one another. Jesus says in verse 3, as Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, so they left that moment, now they go to another place, Jesus now starts to wrap up for them or wants to go on this kind of this teaching about what he really was talking about. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. They were probably frustrated. What do you mean this building is going to fall down? What do you mean like this temple will no longer be here? What do you mean? Tell us, they said, when, when will this happen? What will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? And then Jesus goes on with this teaching. And if you go into chapter 24, this is where we can kind of people wrestle with what is the ending going to look like. Jesus goes on and says there won't be a day or hour that nobody knows. Nobody knows. Only the Father. The Son doesn't even know. But the Father knows. So he goes on and tells them and answers their questions specifically in chapter 24. But in 25, it starts to look a little different. It's not so much of when the end will come, but more about what are you doing before the end comes? Like, what is your behavior like? What does your life look like? And he goes on and gives these parables to help us understand, wait a second, yeah, the end will come. We know that. And he uses different illustrations to show that or parables to show that. But this one particular I want to talk about today, this parable of the talents. Let's read it in verse 14. Again, it will be like a man going on a journey who, was call, who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To one he called, he gave five bags of gold. To another, two bags of and another one, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five more. So also the one with two bags of gold gained two more. But the man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned, settled accounts with them. Now, I want to just pause right there. Now, when we look at this text, okay, we can look at this story. Uh, people are given a different amounts of gold. I don't know about you, but I would be a little ticked off if I was only given one bag of gold and someone was given five. I would be a little upset. God, why am I only getting one and this guy over there got five? Why did he even get two? I think this comes to a lot of comes to us at times when we might be, I mean, me and Pastor Chris said did this, we probably repented hopefully after, shortly after, but like, why does that guy have that house and I have this house? Like, th- this is the story, or sometimes this is even the dilemma or the, the frustration of our heart at times. Like, why do things, why am I given certain things and other people are not? God, you, in your providence, why did you give that person that and me this? I think there's a simple truth here or a simple thing that we can understand is this. We might not have the ability to handle more than what we have. 
Like we are given just the amount we need. And the purpose isn't so I can get my house or so I can get my car or so I can get the lifestyle that I want one day and my beach house and my, you know, I'm kind of, my mind starts racing. Dave, I know would like tickets to the World Series coming up, you know. <laughs> so the, the bottom line is we have all ideas of all the things we could do with money, right? But that's not what he's even talking about here. We have been given exactly what we need. Here's the, here's the thing I need us to understand before we even go any farther. I don't really think Jesus is even talking about money here. We're talking about just flat out abilities. The things that you and I are given and have been responsible for. It might be money. It might be your time. It might be your gifts. But if we really think back to Matthew 24 for a second, what are we even talking about in the first place? The end. We're talking about Jesus goes on this teaching to talk about when the end is coming. What Jesus is talking about here is saying that you and I have been given something, a gospel message, a a, a message of reconciliation. And we have been given certain places and spaces in life to go and share this message of reconciliation with people. And your space looks different than my space And your life looks different than my life. We all have been given these certain things, and it looks different. And guess what? He's God, and I'm not. He's God, and you're not. And he has decided in his providential will for you to exist in the very exact place and time that you're at. And I want to sometimes just say, that's not fair. Just like my kids say to me sometimes. But my father knows what's best for me. He knows what's best for me. And I have a choice to do with what he's given me according to his will and his purposes. Is it my will that I'm going to act out in? Or is it his will that I'm going to use what he's given me? And let's continue on. After a long time, the master of those servants returned to settle accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I have gained five more. So already it's understood that whatever he's given me, my job is to do what? To multiply it, to grow it, to to throw the seed, to keep on watering the seed that I've thrown. I, my goal is to multiply and care for what he's given me. Not for my purposes, but for who? His purposes and his glory. The, the person with the five immediately understood that. That one day this master would come back and my job was to multiply what he's given me. This is not to be used for me. This is to be used for him. I have gained five more, he says. Verse 21, his master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put in your charge of many things. Come and share your, uh, share your master's happiness. I think this is a really important thing for us to understand is this. I don't know about you, but I like, and I brought this up before, we like a little affirmation at times. We do. We like affirmation. We like to feel good about what we've been doing. God will one day come back and say, well done, good and faithful servant. If, if we do something very specific, if we are faithful, I think this is the piece that we miss here in this parable is we're like, oh, I need to multiply my money. I need to multiply something else. No, he's saying multiply your faithfulness. 
Continue to be faithful in your money. Continue to be faithful in your job. Continue to be faithful at home. Continue to be faithful in your church community. Continue to be faithful in your larger community. Be faithful. But to me, in those spaces that he's been given us, we must be faithful at all times. Well done, good and faithful servant. He goes on, verse 22, the man with two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, you entrusted to me two bags of gold. See, I've gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share in your master's happiness. Could you all do me a favor real quick? Could you look at verse 21 again and look at verse 23? What's different about them? Nothing. I'll give you the answer. Nothing is different about them. So the person with five and the person with two, no matter how it is that you and I, how many we have, it doesn't matter. The response is the same by the father, by the master. Well done, good and faithful servant who only had a $30,000 a year job or only had a million dollar job only. Um, But whatever it is, it doesn't matter. The response is the same. Well done, good and faithful servant. I've put you in charge of three people at work. I've put you in charge of 80 people at work. I've put you in charge of the whole entire company where thousands of people are. Whatever your job is, it doesn't matter. Good and faithful servant, well done. I don't want to miss this point. You and I have been entrusted something, but we must bestow upon them the love of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is what we're talking about, the end coming. So you and I, no matter what different amounts we get, we will always be able to hear the same response, well done, good and faithful servant, if We are faithful. 24. Then the man who had received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I knew the bag of gold. I knew uh, I received one bag of gold. The master, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here's what belongs to you. I got to say, if you focus on that last sentence, you're going to be like, oh, he's just giving him back what he was giving him. What a good, faithful servant. He didn't lose it. He didn't gamble it. He didn't try something and all of a sudden get himself in trouble. He's just returning what's his. You and I have been given a great commission, a commission by Jesus himself. Go and make. We have to make more of what we have. Go and make disciples. And so if we're sitting here and going, oh, this is what I have. I didn't mess up. I didn't mess up. I did nothing wrong. Something's wrong. We're off. Something's really off. But look at what he does first. Master, I knew you are a hard man. Harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not. I was afraid. Feel bad for me. You know, this is a lot of times our reaction to things. Immediately, if conflict were to come your way or some type, someone were to bring something, hey, um, I saw you did this and this was wrong. What is our first reaction? But, but, I mean, it was just like the the first thing that Eve did or Adam did. But the woman you gave me, the woman you gave me, she made me do it. Our first reaction is always to say, hey, Lord, it's your fault. It's you gave me this spouse. You gave me this job. You gave me this money. You gave me. If you would have... If you would have, things would have looked differently. Out of fear, take pity on me. 
I went out and did exactly what you were supposed to do. I read this commentator in a commentary and he said this. He said that the reason why they would hide their gold is because they would store up money for themselves so that they can get out of slavery and no longer be a slave to the master. They're going to buy their freedom. The worst thing that you and I can do, the worst thing a Christian can do is look at what the Bible says as chains. You're not reading the same Bible. You're putting an, your own interpretation on it. Oh, the Bible says I, I can't have sex before marriage. Nah. The Bible says I, I shouldn't lust. Nah. He don't know my condition. He doesn't know what I'm struggling with. He says I should honor him. Nah. I should submit to my spouse. Ooh, that's a rough one. Like there is a reality that a lot of times we like to kind of black or strike through some of these lines that we're reading because it makes us feel better. But really, what you're really out for, what you're looking out for is just me, myself, and I. It's about a selfish agenda. It's when you're looking at this text, you're God, God, what can I get out of this? When we start to take on a perspective of a, a different perspective of where we say, this is what the master has told me to do, so therefore I must do it. And this is what a faithful servant will do. He will do, she will do what the Bible says to do. And believe it or not, in that you will find freedom and joy and peace. So immediately he points the fingers back at the master. Look how the master replies. His master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. I mean, there's, there's a lot that you can pull out of there, that you can pull out of the wicked, you selfish person. You self-seeking, really evil comes out of selfishness, self-worship, lazy. I, I like how he puts that in there. Are we really multiplying? Are we looking at, I mean, if we were to do like a real look at our own individual lives, are we saying, well, the gospel, the glory of God has been multiplied in my life in some way? Am I using my time, my talent, my treasure, and my temple to multiply the kingdom of God? Like, I got to be honest with you. Sometimes I look at different spaces in my life. I'm like, oh, man. Wow, Lord. Yes, I've been lazy here. And this is not about, ooh, let me go fix the mic stand. No, that's not about that. This is about the glory of God, the coming of the end of time. People are going to hell. They're going to die. And you have a message. You have a message of hope. You have a message of love. You have a message to give them. And guess what you do? You bury it in the sand. You keep it at home because it's for you and only you. It's your get out of jail free card, not theirs. You don't want them to look at you too bad. This is about the coming of the end. You wicked and lazy servant. And this is a word to many of us here today. You wicked and lazy servant. So you knew that I harvested where I have not sown and gathered where I have not scattered seed? Well, then you should have put your money on deposit with the bankers at least. Come on, do something with it if you know that's what I'm going to do. So that when I returned, I would have not received it with interest. And this is what he does. And here's the reality check for us here today. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has 10 bags. For whoever has been given more and they will have, abund they will have abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. And throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. I want to just say this. I'm not going to kick you out of the church. I'm not going to kick you out of church. I would love for you to come to church. And hopefully one day you would hear this message and be changed by it. But one day, one day, there will be one day when you will stand before the master 
And you have to answer and give an account for what you have done with your life. I look at it like this. This is, I mean, maybe it's because me and Jen did a lot of skits like this that uh, the one time I would say, let's do it right now if we're on our game. But um, there was this one skit we did with youth group and um, our, our youth, uh, our children in youth group, and then not our children, but the children in youth group. And we would put this uh, skit together where someone actually died. They didn't know they died, and they got to watch their life on a video screen, big projector. And they would press different buttons and be able to see different things from their life or things they would have if they died. Maybe the new car, the big mansion, the streets of gold. But the one button, the red button, was the button that was a reality check button. It was the real scenario button. Many of us are living lives, guess what, where you're, you're, just, you're going to hell. And the fantasy we're living is no longer a fantasy. It's a reality. And so then before the projector was the reality of a lost person going to hell. And this person was absent. The person in the skit was absent from God forever. I want to be be honest with you. It is really easy to play Christian in 21st century. You can you could talk the talk, you could walk the walk, but there will be one day you will stand before a holy God, and He will have to you will have to answer to Him only. You have to answer to Him, and you will have to stand before Him and give an account. And the reality is. He's not going to play nice. Were you faithful or were you not? Were you wicked and lazy? Or did you continue to sacrificially give for the sake of the gospel? And I'm not talking about money. I'm talking about your life. Like a Romans 12, 1 and 2 life. This scripture that we keep on coming back to in this series. Therefore, I urge you, brothers in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Lord Jesus, we uh, thank you for uh, just a simple word of a parable. Uh, God, that started that whole thing, the whole from 24 to 25, we see the disciples starting off wondering about the end. The end. 